presence this morning. Get all the glory, Lord, that you are deserving. Thank you for this time to praise you, Lord. To start our day and start our week in praise. Singing our prayers to you, Lord. Be glorified. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We all said, family. Amen. Let's sing. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore Parted the raging sea, my God holds the victory. Oh, the joy! There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out in the rain. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is sure.
We sing from now into eternity for the Lord. Amen. Bringing Him glory. We're going to learn a brand new song this morning, church. It's called Same God. It's how the chorus goes. You follow me.
God, you touch the lepers then. I feel your touch right now. You are the same, God. You are the same. I'm calling on the Holy Spirit. I'm calling on the Holy Spirit. Almighty River, come and fill me up. Come and fill me up. Come and fill me up. And Lord, that is our prayer, that we will continue to call upon you and that you do hear our prayers, Lord, and that we're able to stand on the rock, which is you. So Lord, may this time of worship be glorified and honoring to you. Lord, we're thankful that we're here this morning. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys may have a seat. Good morning, everybody. Hi, hi, hi. All right, ready? Good morning, everybody. There we go. Good to see you guys. God bless you. I want to welcome those who are joining us online, those who are on the patio. And for those who may be here for the very first time, I want to welcome you uh, to Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. Uh, we have a couple of video announcements we'd like to show you. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. Before we begin today's teachings, we'd like to share some exciting things coming your way. So let's get into our announcements. Single moms and female guardians, we invite you and your children to attend our Single Moms Mother's Day Dinner, A Night in Italy, this Friday, May 6th at 6.30 p.m. A delicious Italian dinner for moms will be held in the banquet hall at 7 p.m. After dinner, you will enjoy a time of worship and a devotion from 2 Corinthians 2.15 titled The Fragrance of Christ. Children will enjoy worship, a devotion, and a pizza dinner. The cost for this event is $13 per family, and you can register online through this Wednesday, May 4th. We are still in need of servants for this event. If you would like to serve the single moms and their children, sign up online. Men, join us on Thursday, May 12th through Sunday, May 15th for our father and son fishing trip. This is a great opportunity for fathers to spend time with their sons, gather for fellowship alongside like-minded men, and be in God's word together. We will be heading to Brown's Mill Pond Campground in Bishop, and the cost to attend is just $28 per person. You don't have to know how to fish to have a great time growing memories that will last a lifetime. Join us for fun, fellowship, and a night of bowling on Saturday, May 21st at Bowling Lanes in Montclair. The cost is $30 per person and includes two hours of bowling, shoe rental, pizza, soda, and dessert. The event is open for everyone in our fellowship and all ages are welcome. You are welcome to sign up for one person to play or set up a team. You may also request to play with family and friends. Online registration is open through Sunday, May 15th or until spaces are filled. Men, we invite you to this year's men's conference, Stand Fast, on Saturday, June 4th from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. We will kick off the morning with a steak breakfast and fellowship. After the breakfast ends, our very own Pastor David Rosales and Jason Duff from the Garden Fellowship will be sharing powerful messages along with the testimony to be given. These messages will focus on some of the daily challenges and topics that are relevant to men today. The cost to attend the teaching is only $7. The breakfast and teaching is $17, and we are also offering a bundle deal for a limited time that includes a t-shirt for $27. Don't miss out on this amazing event. Parents, give your kids the opportunity to grow in their walks with the Lord and build lasting friendships through Kids Camp. Kids in 2nd through 6th grade will spend Friday, June 10th through Sunday, June 12th studying God's Word and enjoying the various outdoor activities while learning what it means to be torchbearers for Christ. The last day to register for Kids Camp is Sunday, May 15th. In our city and across America, the observance of the National Day of Prayer will be held this Thursday, May 5th. The theme this year is Exalt the Lord who has established us, based on the verse in Colossians 2, 6 through 7. Calvary Chapel Chino Valley will be leading an outdoor prayer service at 12 p.m. in front of Chino City Hall, featuring our very own CCCV worship team. In the evening, beginning at 7 p.m., we will host a special prayer service in the chapel. Join us as we spend time joined together in worship and prayer, lifting up the needs of the church, our nation, and our leaders. Servant training introduces the many opportunities to serve within kids ministry. From preparing crafts in the resource room to sharing God's word with young hearts, you can be a part of a ministry that seeks to pour out God's love to kids and their families who visit CCCV. 
You can sign up online for our next servant training classes taking place on Wednesday, May 4th and Sunday, June 5th. Before we continue the service, please take a moment to silence your cell phone and to limit distractions, we ask that you please stay in your seat until service is over. For more information on events, registration, or opportunities to serve, be sure to visit our website at calvaryccv.org. Thank you for being with us and have a blessed week. Just a couple of other announcements that we have. Tonight we'll have our Sunday night of prayer, which will be uh, tonight at 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m., which is in room 304. If you're not familiar with our campus, if you go out these doors here, you'll see our chapel store. It's upstairs, right in that area. We'll have our time for our church to come together and corporately pray uh, with the things that are going on, especially with the AB, uh, uh, the AB 2223 bill that's been passed uh, as we want to pray for the things that are going on in the church and for things like that. Everybody is welcome. Uh, there is no child care. It's a great time to get into God's word and, uh, and, and to spend some time in worship. And then our Lion Tamers ministry on Tuesday, May 3rd from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. right here in the cafe patio. Uh, they'll be hosting a special event that the ministry wants to open up to the entire church. Uh, they, those who are curious to know what Lion, Lion Tamers is all about, they're having a night called Tacos and Testimony. It's going to be a, where several men and women who have recovered from substance abuse and anger issues, sharing their personal testimony and powerful, their powerful testimony on how submitting to Jesus changed their lives. Everyone's welcome to attend, and it's free tacos, beans and rice, and I'm just reading here, and Jesus Christ. So uh, you guys come on out. To, <laughs> uh, as mentioned, we'll have our National Day of Prayer, uh, the 74th. 71st National Day of Prayer. It's going to be Thursday, May 5th at uh, 2022. It's going to be at the outdoor in front of City Hall at 12 p.m. And then we'll have our here at the in the chapel uh, at 7 p.m. for our National Day of Prayer. It's a good time to come on out and join our church family if we pray for different things of our nation. And then just a brief mention of our Holy Grounds Cafe. Uh, we have our Holy Grounds Cafe. If you're looking for a refreshment drink or maybe want to grab something to eat afterwards, stop by the cafe and they'll have a variety of things on the menu that you can order from. As we continue our time of worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings, I often used to ask myself, why do we tithe and why do we give? You know, and I had this thing of that I was doing what was called sectional worship. I would worship the Lord in my singing. I would worship the Lord through the Bible study, but when it came to giving, I was like, oh, I don't know about that. But when I realized that my life needed to surrender to the Lord and that part of my worship included giving, that it wasn't what I gave, it was how I gave. And when we worship the Lord in response of all that he's done for us, the Bible tells us that when we give to him as an act of worship, it's not the amount, it's what's purposed in our hearts. And this morning, we have the privilege of worshiping the Lord through our giving. And then we have multiple ways that we're able to give this morning. For those that are watching online on Facebook and YouTube, there's a link in the chat box that you can click on and it opens up a page to give. For those who brought their gifts here this morning, uh, we have agape boxes that are located in the foyers. And then right in front of you in your pew, there's a QR code that you can open up your camera and you scan it and it sends you to a link to our giving page. So you see that we have multiple ways of giving. And again, it's not because God wants your money. It's because it's an act of worship to him as we worship the Lord in our entire life. And we have the privilege of giving. So this morning what we'd like to do is, is uh, give our gifts to the Lord, but we'd like to also have a time of continued worship with a song after this time. So why don't we bow our hearts and pray. Father, we thank you so much that we're able to worship you. We're able to worship you through our, the singing and through the Bible study, Lord. And, and now we have this privilege of worshiping you through our giving. And Lord, you're not interested in the amounts, Lord, or you're interested in, in our hearts. May our hearts always be open to glorify and honor your name. Lord, we love you and we thank you. Lord, we lift up our pastor as he is going to give our Bible study this morning, that our hearts will be opened up. And Lord, that would receive what the Spirit is speaking to us. So Lord, we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Can we all stand together, family? Let's sing of our Savior this morning. gathered here. We thank you, Lord, for this place that we can meet. We thank you, Lord, that you've given to us your word. And our, our hearts would be open and receptive to what the Spirit is speaking to us this morning. Lord, teach us 
how that we might live in a way that pleases you and be blessed by you. Lord, we lift those who are watching online right now, those who are outside, and I just pray, Father, that this spirit, your spirit would move upon every one of us. Draw us to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, God bless you. I'm glad you're here. Let's open our Bibles to Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. We'll be looking this morning at verses 17 through 31, a very famous story, the rich young ruler he normally is spoken of. I chose to entitle it, The Rich Young Fool, and you'll see why in just a moment. I'd remind you uh, that we do have a, a young adult study on Monday nights, and so tomorrow night, it's at 7.30, it meets in the banquet hall. It's for those 18, 28, 18, 29 or so, young adults. We're going to have Brennan uh, with us. Brennan Beeler will be sharing uh, tomorrow night. I invite you guys who are of that age group to be there. And again, that'll be at 7.30, and it'll be a special night. Um, Wednesday, we continue our series in the book of Ephesians for those who are able to be with us. And we'll be looking in chapter 4, beginning at around verse 24. We're going to be looking at the new man that which uh, God has created, that who we are in Jesus Christ. So that'll be this upcoming Wednesday night, obviously, and Tuesday morning, we have our, our men's study, men's breakfast study. Fellas, I invite you to be part of that. It's a good thing. This last Friday, we had a great uh, time with the guys. I think we have a couple pictures to show. Uh, I'm pretty sure we do. If not, hi, how you guys doing? <laughs> now, John told me we had pictures. John, <laughs> you're getting fired again, man. There we go. Yeah, we were cooking John. Uh, so anyway, it went really well. We had a little over 500 men who showed up on, uh, on Friday night and uh, gave an invitation, and several came forward to get right with the Lord. So it was a real blessing. And uh, yeah, there's John once again eating. My goodness, John, are you in every shot? Let's see, where can we find John? There he is behind the tree. <laughs> there he is singing, looking like Holland Davis. How many pictures do we have? That's enough. <laughs> anyway, it was good. We'd love to have you guys. We're going to be having our men's, uh, men's uh, Saturday in June on the 4th, June 4th. And so I'd invite you fellows to be part of that. It's already been announced. Let's see, one more thing. Um, we had a great time in Israel. I, don't, I haven't spoken about it. I'm not going to do it right now. But uh, I do invite you to go with us. If you've never been to Israel, uh, it's one of those trips that I would invite you to do your best to save, do what you can to come. It is well worth it. My wife and I have been many times. We love going to Israel. And we're always refreshed in the Lord there. We gain new insights and to scripture every time we go. So I invite you to go. We are going to take an interest sign up in a couple of weeks to see whether there are enough people who'd like to go to go with us. It's going to be around the same price we spent this last time. I think it was $40,000 or something. No, I'm just kidding. Enough people will believe me. It's around $4,000 for everything. And it's about a 11 or 12 day tour. And so we'll give you information, but we are going to take an interest sign up just to see if there are any who would like to go with us next year. It's probably going to be at the very end of February, perhaps the first portion of March, and it usually, as I said, lasts about 11 or 12 days. We'll give you information as we have it. Today we're in Mark chapter 10. We're going to look at verses 17 through 31. We're looking at the story of the rich young ruler. Also, I would consider the rich young fool, and you'll see why. We call, I call him that or mention him in that way in just a moment. We'll begin reading at verse 17 in Mark chapter 10. I'll read to verse 22 and we'll get into our study. Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 17, reading to verse 22. Mark writes, Now as he was, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. 
You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then, then Jesus, looking at him, slapped him in the face. No, then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. So as I normally do, I'm going to give to you a, a context. I'm going to lay a foundation for you so you can see what is taking place here in this particular event that is recorded uh, for us in the Gospel of Mark. The Bible reveals to us that God is a God who desires to have a relationship with His creation. He desires to have a relationship with people. And it is His desire to save all who come to Him, all who come to Him, in genuine faith. In 2 Peter 3, verse 9, the apostle Peter said, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Not wanting anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. In Ezekiel 33, verse 11, in the Old Testament, Say to them, As surely as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked should turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Again in Isaiah 45, verse 22, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. So the Bible teaches that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Bible teaches us that God desires a relationship with man. And even though we've turned away from him, the Bible also reveals that he seeks for us. We see it in the Garden of Eden at the, in, the, in the beginning, in the first book of the Bible, when God called out to Adam. And when God called out to Adam, he simply said, where are you? In Jeremiah 7:25, it reads, from the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt to this day, I have persistently sent all my servants, the prophets, to them day after day. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He seeks them out from the Garden of Eden to this day. In the New Testament, Jesus is revealed as the seeking Savior, searching for and calling the lost. When you read the, uh, the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, you see this as it's portrayed in a series of parables. You see it when the Lord um, seeks out the lost sheep, when he seeks for that lost coin, you see it when he seeks for that lost son. In Luke 19, verse 10, it simply says, The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. So God reveals himself as a God who seeks, but he also commands us to seek him. In 1 Chronicles 16, verse 11, Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. In Isaiah 55, verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. So it is God who seeks us, but it is also God who puts it into our hearts to seek after him. In John 6, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the important part is that under his prompting, we seek him, and we do so with sincere faith. In Deuteronomy 4, 29, You will seek the Lord your God. You will find him if you search for him with all your heart and all your soul. Now, there are many who have said that they sought God, but they could not find him. And that's not because God couldn't be found. It's because very often they have their own agenda. And this is what we see here. When confronted with a choice, this man decides to walk away. This story is a story illustrating man's unwillingness to trust the Lord. And notice with me, though he initially appeared to be hungry for truth, the fact is he really wasn't. At first, he seemed to show great interest in spiritual things. But even so, we must remember that interest is not a synonym for complete trust and faith. So today, we're going to be looking at a man that everybody has heard of, the rich young ruler. I simply refer to him as the rich young fool because he turned away and didn't follow the Lord. So beginning at verse 17, once again, it says, 
As he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now, this particular story is mentioned in Matthew, in Mark, as well as the Gospel of Luke. And by combining the accounts of the story, we get a more complete picture of what is taking place. So I'm going to kind of outline these very quickly to you so you can see what's taking place and get a better picture of it. Again, Mark 10, 17 says that he came running, which would seem to reveal eager interest. In chapter 10, verse 17, it says he came and knelt before him. In Luke 18, 18, it says he called Jesus good teacher, which reveals respect and reverence. In Mark 10, 22, Mark informs us that he was very rich, having great possessions. In Matthew 19, verse 20, he's a young man, because he says, all these I have kept, the young man said. Again, in Luke 18, in verse 18, it reveals that he's a synagogue ruler, revealing he's an extraordinarily devout young man. He was between the ages of 21 and 28, and he was known for sincere religious devotion. He was the spiritual leader who chose those who read the Torah, the law, in synagogue services. It was he who gave the sermon. He's the one who supervised the services of the synagogue. And one commentator said that this implies that he was part of the council called the Sanhedrin, the most respected rabbis in Israel. In Mark 10, 17, in asking what he should do to inherit eternal life, this reveals that he's a Pharisee. He's spiritually unsatisfied, which seems to have propelled him to Jesus Christ. Notice with me when Jesus says, keep the commandments, he claims to us that he has. So what we have is a rich, respected, reverent, religious young man who is spiritually unsatisfied. He had everything that should have made him happy, but he's lacking something. And it's this emptiness that left a gnawing hunger in his soul. It's this emptiness that kept him awake at night. It's this emptiness that causes him to come running to Jesus and to kneel at his feet. And after everything is taking place here, Matthew sums it up in chapter 19, verse 20, by saying that the young man said to Jesus, I've kept these things, but what do I still lack? I've done all these things. What do I lack? I've done my best to do everything in the right way, but I'm empty. So Jesus is going to answer that profound question, what do I still lack? It says in verse 17, he was going out on the road, and in Matthew 19, 16, Matthew says, Behold, one came and said to him. So when Matthew chose to use the word behold, he treats it as if it's something that is unusual, which it really is. A young religious, rich young man realizes he's lacking something, and he comes for help. That's unusual because those who are rich and those who are young normally do not recognize a need. This is an absolute fact. We know it. Those of us who are growing older in life realize that. When you're young, You've got everything. When you're young, you think that nothing will ever go wrong. When you're young, you're going to live forever. When you're young, all your dreams are going to come true. When you're young, you take chances. You're daring. You do things that, that an older person wouldn't do. You think the older people are, are just afraid, but you're courageous. In reality, you're just impetuous, and they've already learned their lessons. So when you're young, you think you're going to live forever. And if you have money... You've got it made. I'm young and I'm rich. I've got everything that I need. I don't need anything else. Ecclesiastes 10, 19 says it like this. Money is the answer for everything. I've got my youth. I've got my health. I've got everything. I've got religion. I'm well respected. I, I'm a man of prominence. I'm a young man. Like it says, you know, when it refers to him as a young man, commentators, more than one commentator were pointing out that the way that was presented means that his age would have been somewhere, as I mentioned, between 21 and 28. Those of you who are above 28 and admit it, ask yourself, did you not know everything when you were 21? Ask yourself. You know, it's like what Mark Twain said. When I was 17, my father was an idiot. When I turned 21, I was amazed at how much the old man learned in four years. <laughs> when you're young... You've got it made. And when you're young with cash and religious on top of that and people respect you, they ask you for your advice. 
and you're a spiritual man, you're a devout man, you've got all of that going for you. That's the condition of this young man. He's a person who's got everything that his society would have promoted as being good. Everything. And so this is a young man who's got money, he's got youth, and not only that, he's a man with dignity. A man with dignity during the time of Christ, a man with dignity and influence, would never run in public. You might find that interesting. But a man of dignity, wealth, influence, never would run in public. You have this in verse 17 where it says, as he was going out on the road, one came running and knelt before him. One came running, that's an unusual thing. That's why Matthew would emphasize it by saying, behold. The reason that the men of dignity would not run is because it was humiliating for them to have to lift their long robes and expose their legs in the Jewish culture. That was a humiliating thing, to look at an old man's legs is also sickening, but <laughs> that's why we should never wear shorts. <laughs> but it was humbling. It was humbling to gather up their long robes and expose their legs. That was considered shameful. That was considered undignified. And by the way, just as an aside, that's one of the aspects of the story of the prodigal son that sometimes people miss. Because in the prodigal son, when that son had taken his portion and had gone to a far off land and had used it up in wasteful living, there's a long story. I don't know if I should go into it. I'll give you a little bit of it. It's not part of my study. I, I just wanted to emphasize one aspect of it. But in the story of the prodigal son, you can read it from what is called a Western theologian's perspective, or you can look at it from the Middle Eastern theologian's perspective. And when you read it from a Middle Eastern perspective, you see a lot of cultural things that you don't, you don't necessarily see with Western eyes. And when this young man took that which was of his father's and asked for it in advance, the norm, normal thing was for the young man to receive his inheritance after the father dies. And so when he says, give me that which is mine, he's actually saying, I can't wait for you to die. I want my money now. And that's what got everybody so upset. And so when he humiliated his father in that way, and he took off and wasted his father's inheritance on, on, on bad living, well, there was a council in the village that was called, it was, it, they would have what is called the ritual of Ketsatsa. And what that is, is that they would, they would pronounce this young man as the council elders to be dead. And so he was not to come back to the village. And if he came back to the village, great harm could be done to him. That's why the father is portrayed as watching out, looking for the son. Now the son is there wasting all of his father's inheritance and just wasteful living. And he would have eaten the, the food that pigs ate. And he came to himself and he said, I'm going to go back to my father because even in my father's house, servants are doing better than I am. Now that isn't the place of repentance for him. That's another scheme for him to come home because he's not living well right now. So he chooses to come and he's already rehearsed his speech. Father, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your servants. He's already re rehearsed his scheme. But the scripture tells us while he was yet far off, his father saw him. So in Luke 15, 20, the son had decided to return home and he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now that people would not understand. We Westerners don't realize it. The father saw him and ran to him. It's a picture of humiliation. The prodigal son was a, was a portion of scripture that Muslim scholars would debate Christians 
in because they said there's no incarnation in this particular story. The, the boy turns and says, I'll come back to my father, and he's welcomed back with open arms. But the Middle Eastern understanding would have been this. No, when that father lifted his robes and ran in public to embrace him and protect him against the judgment that was coming, that's a picture of the humiliation of Christ who took upon himself human flesh, dwelt amongst us, and bore our sins. And so for this father to run in public, that's one of the things in the aspect of the story that, that is so amazing, that a man ran, the father ran. It's the only time you see God run in Scripture. And he ran to embrace the son, to embrace him and hold him and protect him against the judgment that was coming for what he had done. And that's why when that son says, I no longer deserve to be called your son, he doesn't have to go any further because that's where his point of true repentance took place. When I saw my father humiliate himself to protect me from judgment to come, I have sinned and I'm no longer worthy. And that's when the father just says, no, kill the slaughter, slaughter the calf, the fatted calf. My son who was lost has come back to me. So that's a beautiful picture of voluntary humiliation. In the Jewish society, the, the, an older man would never lift his robes and run because that was a picture of humiliation. And that is what's taking place here with this younger man, a man of dignity, a man of, of prominence, even as a young man, would never run somewhere. So this is not an accident that Mark, in, Mark includes that description, again in verse 17, when it says, he was going out on the road and one came running. It's a picture of an eagerness, is actually an outward picture of humility, even a willingness to be taught. So he respectfully approaches Jesus. Notice that he calls him, he calls Jesus good teacher. He acknowledges, in other words, that Jesus is a great and respected rabbi only. He acknowledges that Jesus is an expert in the Old Testament, that he's a, a teacher of truth. Now, he may have called him good teacher in order to flatter him to gain favor. That's a common tactic even to this day, to politely flatter someone to disarm them. Well, he says in verse 17, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So the young man believes in an afterlife. He desires to enjoy it. He thought that eternal life was something he could obtain by religious works. That's why he says, what shall I do? What is the most important good work that I can perform to win eternal life? Now, in spite of all his good works, his religious zeal, an effort that he's making to be righteous, he's still empty. What shall I do to have spiritual satisfaction? What must I do to have knowledge of God? You see, eternal life is not length of life. Eternal life is quality of life that extends. In Romans 14, 17, it says, God's kingdom does not consist of food and drink but of righteousness, peace, and joy produced by the Holy Spirit. What must I do to have quality of life? And John 17, 3 says, This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. It's a quality of life that is built on fellowship with God. That's the answer to the question. But for this man, how can I obtain eternal life? How can I be saved? I'm spiritually empty. I need to be filled. How can this occur in my life? I deserve this kind of life, but I don't know how to go about getting assurance of it. Well, in another place, this kind of question was asked of Jesus. In John 6, 28 and 29, they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. What is it that I must do? You must believe in the one whom he sent. You must believe in Christ. Now notice with me, this is an open door, and yet Jesus doesn't take advantage of it. Instead, he seems to make it even more difficult to come to peace with God. By his response, Jesus even appears to be a bit antagonistic. So Jesus questions him, verse 18, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. Why do you ask this question? He's searching out the man's state of heart. He wants to reveal the motives of this man's question. He's forcing the man to see what he is really 
hiding in his own heart. Very often when Christ would ask questions, it wasn't because Jesus didn't have an answer. When a rabbi would ask questions, it was in order to draw out from that person what they think. That's what questions do. So he's not playing with him. He's asking him something to reveal the state of his heart. Why do you call me good? Tell me what you think. Now, when Jesus asks questions, again, it's intended to draw them out. And we've seen this uh, several times. I, I chose just to look at a few of the questions Christ asked as we've gone through Mark. I haven't listed all of them. There are quite a number of them. But, for example, in Mark chapter 8, Jesus had asked a question. Who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? He asked the question. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, loses his own soul? In Mark 9, what was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? Again, in Mark chapter 10, verse 3, what did Moses command you? When he asks the question, it's not because he doesn't have the answer. When he asks the question, he wants you to supply the answer, which causes you to look within yourself to see what you really believe. That's why rabbis would ask questions. He's probing to find out what this man thinks about him. You see, the young man came to Jesus in a moment of strong emotion. It reminds me of another story in Luke chapter 9 of a man who came to Jesus and what this man said to him. In Luke 9, 57, it says, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Well, it seemed like he was ready to be a disciple, but Jesus responded in an interesting way. And in Luke 9, 58, Jesus replied, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. You don't know what the cost is to follow me. And so I, I'm coming to you. I'm asking you a question. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus' response after the man had called him good, he says again in verse 18, Why do you call me good? Are you applying useless flattery to me? Do you re really believe I am who I am? It would seem the young man was applying a polite title to Jesus. He was saying that Jesus was a good teacher, that he recognized that he was one who had come from God. But by asking this question, he's provoking. Jesus is provoking him to rethink the word good. People can be relatively good. People are bad. But only God himself is absolutely good. So do you see me for who I actually am, God in the flesh, or are you just being polite? You see, in verse 18, no one is good but one, that is God. In Psalm 34, verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Psalm 107, verse 1, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. There's no one good but one, that is, God. But he goes on in verse 19. You know the commandments. You're a synagogue ruler. You're, you're steeped in, in Scripture. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. You know the commandments. Now, notice how he refers to certain commands. He wants them to consider what these commandments actually mean. He does this once again to reveal to him that even though he knows them, he doesn't understand them. You see, Paul came to understand that. Paul came to understand that the law demands perfect obedience. In Romans 10, verse 5, Moses writes that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of its commands. So God's commands revealed what we were to do, but they also exposed our weakness. The will is present, but the ability to perform that which we desire is not. We can't obey them. That's the whole point. We have a weakness, a sin nature, a weakness of our flesh. And that's when Paul realized that the law led us to faith in Jesus Christ. In Galatians 3.24, it says the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. 
In John 5, 39 and 40, Jesus said, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. See, the law was intended to expose many things. There's so many things you see in the law. I'm just touching on one thing, but it was intended to expose our weakness, our inability to do that which we claim to desire to do. The law says this to us so it exposes and even gives a name to the things that we're doing and lets us know that these are not pleasing to God. So committing adultery, you wouldn't know it was wrong until God said it is wrong. To steal, you wouldn't think it was wrong. It, sometimes you might even think it's a smart thing to do. To hurt somebody, you think it's the right thing to do. We could, we could, we could go in and, and, and justify pretty much everything we do, but the law says you're not to steal, you're not to kill. Honor your father and your mother. These are things that expose our hearts. Our hearts are not prone to do those kinds of things. Now remember, this young man had just asked him, what shall I do? And Jesus says, keep the commandments. He says, keep the commandments to awaken him to his inability to do so. You see, it's that failure to do so that produces dryness and dissatisfaction in his life. That's why he's saying all these things I've done from my youth up, and I'm still lacking something. So again in verse 19, you know the commandments. If you attempt to keep them, they will reveal to you how unsatisfied you are. <laughs> but the young man immediately responds, verse 20, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. Once again, that is an aspect of youth. Because when you're young, you think you're better than you are. It's just the way it is. You haven't had that long to do more sins. When you get older, you realize you're quite sinful. It's the story of when the woman was caught in adultery and, and uh, she was brought before the feet of Christ. This woman was caught in adultery in the very act Moses in the law said that such should be stoned, but what do you say? And that's when Jesus wrote on the ground and that's when he said, the one without sin, let him be the first to cast a stone at her. You know the story. And as they were standing there holding these, these rocks in their hands. The Bible tells us from the older to the younger, they began to drop the rock from their hand and walk away from the older to the younger. It wasn't the younger. The younger think that they're better than they are. The older realize they're not that good. That's how it works in life. Again, when you were young, many of you are still young. Many of you think you are. When you were young, you were much better, you were much faster, you're much stronger, much smarter, much more ambitious, much more plans, I'm gonna succeed, much, much, much more. Then you go through life, you learn lessons. As you grow older, you begin to realize, I didn't succeed in all the things I attempted. I didn't do the things that I wanted to do. I never accomplished the things that I want. So you end up buying gold chains in a Corvette. No, I'm just... That's my generation. <laughs> now, as you grow older, you begin to realize that life in many ways did not turn out the way you wanted it to. But when you're young, your future's still way in front of you. The road before you is still very long. When you get older, the road behind you is long, but the road before you is very short. And you're coming to the end of that road. There's nothing wrong with that. That's aging. And you come to realize, hmm, I have less time before me than I have behind me. What did I accomplish? But when you're young, you can speak with resolution. This young man said, all these I've kept from my youth up. What do I still lack? I've done all these things. I've never failed at them. I've never committed adultery. I haven't murdered. I haven't stolen. I don't bear false witness. I haven't defrauded. I honor my father and my mother. I'm keeping all of these things. But I'm still lacking. Again, Matthew 19, 20 adds, what do I yet lack? Well, what he lacks is the assurance of salvation. This young man is like people who have been raised in Christian homes with no conversion experience. There are quite a number of people, young people who were raised in a Christian home who think that they're Christian because they went to church. 
They're Christian because mom and dad followed God. They're Christian because they were raised in Sunday school, dedicated by the pastor, involved in youth, and the whole nine yards. They think they're saved when, in fact, they're dry. They go to college, and it takes one semester for some atheist professor to talk them out of any faith that they claim to have. That happens all the time, unfortunately. They've been raised in a Christian home, but they don't know what the world's all about. They find out the world seems to be much more attractive than they ever heard. That's actually a revelation of his youth. He thought he actually kept these commands. He was sincere, but he was wrong. He could not have kept all the commandments, yet they had an effect on him. So notice verse 21, Jesus looking at him, loved him, and said to him, one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, take up the cross and follow me. One thing you lack. Now I want you to notice how verse 21 says this. Jesus looking at him loved him. So it's the love of Christ for this young man that motivates Jesus to reveal the young man's own heart to himself. It was the young man's lack of love for Jesus that motivated him to walk away. You see, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 19, Matthew adds the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. You see, true faith is expressed through concern for the welfare of other people. So he tells this young man, get rid of everything and follow me. Give to your neighbor, give to the one in need, come follow me. He says, come take up the cross, follow me. That's a demand, a demand to follow him. In Luke 14, verse 33, it says, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. He's saying, you need to be fully committed to me. The thing that is holding you back is your wealth and your trust in it. You say that you have love for others? How deep is your love going to be towards them? Let's find out. Give up what you have. Give to the poor. Follow me. You'll have treasure in heaven. But verse 22, and this is interesting how it says it this way. It says, he was sad at his word and went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. That word grieved. When it speaks of going away sorrowful or grieved, that word means uh, to be wearing a frown in his face. It's, it's a picture that that shows the way he's looking as, as he's walking away. He's frowning because he had great or many possessions. The word great possession, great means many. The word possessions, I looked these things up in the original language. I wanted to see precisely what he was speaking about. The word possession speaks of estates. This man had many estates. He had much land and, and, and holdings. Is what He was a man with a great, great accumulated wealth. And, and his love of wealth and all that he possessed was too powerful to give up. Now, sometimes when people think of wealth, and our society is very guilty of this, when people think of, of wealth, when people think of people being financially off, well, many will say that's, that's evil, that's the evil one percenters and this and that. Just briefly touching this, the Bible doesn't teach that it's a sin to have wealth. Abraham was wealthy. David, the king, was wealthy. Solomon was wealthy. Joseph of Arimathea was wealthy. Zacchaeus was wealthy. Many in Scripture had great wealth. The possession of wealth often indicated that God was blessing somebody's life. In Proverbs 13, 21, it reads, Misfortune pursues the sinner, but prosperity is the reward of the righteous. So wealth in and of itself isn't the problem. This man had great wealth, but that wasn't the problem. It's materialism, it's greed, it's the attachment to riches that can be sinful. In Ecclesiastes 5.10, whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. The rich man is asked how much is enough, and the rich man says a little more. It's this desire for more. It's the thing that uh, the accumulation and <laughs> very often not even spending, but it's the accumulation of wealth and all that it gives 
uh, that, that that's where people uh, make their biggest mistake because when you trust in wealth, it produces a false security. You see, when you don't have any money for a, a doctor bill, prayer becomes a greater tool, doesn't it? It's true. When you don't have a lot of money, you can't afford to go to the doctor. You're on your knees a lot more. That's a fact, and I'm not saying that's bad. It's just a fact. When you have money or you have insurance, then, you know, I'll just go to the doctor. You don't think about it. So what we have as Americans is a lot of prosperity without even realizing it. And I've shared this before. If you have more than one pair of shoes, you're actually very wealthy. If you sleep in a bed and you have a blanket over you, you're very wealthy. If you eat two times, three times a day, you can snack. You're very wealthy. If you have a car, even two or maybe three, you're very wealthy. You just don't realize it because we have a tendency of looking at people like Elon Musk and others who have so much, we think, oh, I'm poor. No, all we have to do is look outside of America for a while, even go into some places in L.A. or even in our own neighborhoods, and you'll see those who really don't have. So many of us are very wealthy without knowing it. We just don't realize it. And, and we, we trust in those things. You know, I have my insurance. I have my finances. I have these things. Well, this, this man, he trusted in his wealth. That's what he did. And according to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, uh, Paul said to Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. You can have an awful lot of money, and then the stock market just crashes, and you lose it all simultaneously. So don't put your hope in wealth. And that's something that goes all the way back 2,000 years plus. So the real danger is that when we trust in, in wealth, we are blinded to eternity. In Luke 12, 15, Jesus said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. In other words, a man's true life is measured by what he is and not in what he has. So this young man's possessions and prestige blinded him to eternity. He loved these things more than he loved the God who had blessed him with these things. So Jesus reveals to the young man that he had failed to keep the command to love his neighbor. If he couldn't keep these commands, he's certainly not keeping the first four because these commands that we find in verse 19, these, these commands are man's duties to other men. These are what are called the second table or second tablet. These are man's duties to man. The first tablet was man's duties to God. If you're not keeping your duties to man, you're not keeping your duties to God because your duties to God as you obey those things produces the fruit of caring for others. If you love God, you love your neighbor as yourself. And seeing that you're not doing these things is demonstrating that you're really not keeping any of them. Well, this man here is having a tough time here. Notice verse 23. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And so he speaks to them. He looks around, verse 23 says, and he's saying it's hard because they love the security they have in this life and they trust in the riches. The idea of giving them up to follow God is difficult for them to do. Well, the disciples in verse 24 are astonished. They're amazed. They're astounded at what he said. And so he went on to say it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. When you trust in riches, you're not trusting in the Lord. They exclude one another. It's impossible for a camel to do this, and it is impossible for us to trust in two masters. So you make a choice. You need to choose what you're going to ultimately rely on because whatever it is that you, you choose to rely on becomes your master. In Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and earthly riches, mammon, it, it, it is not difficult to enter into the kingdom of heaven when you do that. Without Jesus, it's impossible. Well, again, verse 26, they're astonished beyond measure. 
Who then can be saved? Since riches are often a sign of God's blessing and give advantages, who can be saved? Well, riches aren't the issue. Dependence on riches is. And so that's why in verse 27, looking at them, Jesus said, with men it's impossible, not with God, because salvation's a work of God from beginning to the end. In Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight, saith the Lord. Delight in knowing me. Well, here comes the apostle Peter. Once again, he's, he's taken a foot out of his mouth to insert the other one. In verse 28, Peter began to say to him, see, we have left all and followed you. So Jesus answered and said, assuredly, I say to you, there's no one who has left house or brother or sisters or father or mother or wife or, or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters, mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. We've left all, verse 28. We followed you. Jesus, this rich young man, wouldn't leave anything. But we left everything. And Matthew 19, 27 adds, therefore, what shall we have? We left everything. But they still have a need. They have a need of discipleship. We've left everything physically, but remember with me, they were still arguing about who is greatest. They still needed to learn what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus in verses 29 and 30 says, sometimes coming to me is gonna cost you. It'll cost you family, it'll cost you friends. You may lose many who at one time you thought to be your friends, which is true, isn't it? When you came to faith in Christ, perhaps you paid a price like I did. When I came to faith in Christ as a young man, I had a number of friends. We used to have, we used to have a large group of friends. I had a lot of, a lot of people who hung around together. I grew up in a neighborhood where there were a lot of young guys my age, boys my age. I went to school with them from kindergarten all the way into high school. And they didn't move. It was a time when people would actually keep their houses and pay them off. My mom and my dad had one house for, for 30 years, and then they finally, when I moved out here, they finally sold that home in Norwalk and moved out here. But when you bought a house at one time, you actually stayed in it. You didn't use it as a starter home to build up. What you did is you, built, you, you got a house, it became your house, it was your forever home, and that's the way it worked. And so in the neighborhood I came from, and perhaps like many of you may say the same thing, pretty sure you do, you're able to say the same thing. We grew up in the neighborhood, so we knew all the kids. We knew the kids who were a year or two above us because we played Little League with them or were in the Cub Scouts or whatever. We knew them. We went to school with them and the ones who were younger, one or two years younger. And a lot of times we'd hang around. I had groups of friends. We had numbers of friends, a lot of guys. We'd hang around. We'd do stupid things. We grew up together. It was, it was actually like the Wonder Years, this old show that was on many years ago. That was really my life. I had friends. I had friends like that. We gave them nicknames, you know. We had friends. Then you come to faith in Christ. And suddenly these who at one time were your close buddies, the ones that you shared adventures with, and hung around with, and went hitchhiked to the beach with, and talked about your first dates, and what am I gonna do one day when I grow up? I want the ones you dreamed with, the ones you would speak about what you wanted to do as you grew older. I, I had friends, I'd say, oh, one of these days I wanna have this, I wanna do that, I wanna go here, I wanna do this. Oh, I one day wanna go to Europe, and one day I'm gonna go to Hawaii. One of the, and you talk like that. That's what you did. What kind of girl do you wanna marry? Oh, she's gonna be this or she's gonna be that. You talk about your plans. You gonna go to school? I don't think I wanna go to school. I think I'll go in, I'll go in the army or I'll do the Navy or what. You had plans, you talked, that's what it was. Well, that's how my life was. Perhaps you had something similar. And then you come to faith in Christ. And when you come to faith in Christ and you start telling your friends, look what happened, man. 
I gave my heart to Jesus. And all of a sudden, these friends that you were like brothers with, they just start fading away. They don't want to hang with you anymore. And some of them might be so bold as to tell you what I was told. You're a bummer, man. You used to be fun. What happened to you? And that's how it went with me. You used to be a lot of fun. Now you just bum me out. What happened to you? What do you mean, what happened to me? You're not the same guy. I'm not supposed to be. What, you want me to stay the same all the time? Do you stoop and do stupid things with you? No, I grew up, but I gave my heart to God, and they didn't want anything to do with me. And you, you see them peeling away. Many of you have experienced that. That happens because you made a choice. I'm going to follow the Lord, and they didn't want to. And so Jesus speaks about that. But he says, there may be some that you lose. And some of you don't realize this, so I'll say it like this. If you look around here, these people who are seated around you that you don't know, you're in one side over here, you're on one side over there, you don't know everybody in between. You may have the dearest friend you've ever had in your life sitting somewhere in here, yet you just haven't discovered that. I found that out. In a group of people who were strangers to me, I found my dearest friends because they were family in Christ, because we shared the same things. We have the same father. They became my brother. They became my sister. They became my family. That's what Jesus is saying. You may lose some, but you gain so many more. You may have one home, but when you have a brother or a sister who loves you, their home becomes your home. You go and visit them. They make a meal for you. They come and visit you. You make a meal for them. You hang around. You enjoy life. You raise your children. You grow old together. There's nothing like that, guys. There's nothing like that. My, my daughter-in-law, whom I love so much, I love all my, 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 my kids. I shouldn't say it like this, but my Karina has friends and... Uh, we were talking a while back, and I said, you know, you, you love, and I named a, some of her girlfriends that I, I love very much myself, and I said, these are your dear friends, and she goes, yeah, yeah, they are, you know, having babies at the same time, raising your kids, hanging around at the park, those are good things, yeah, I said, Marie and I have friends like that, one of my friends I've had for 65, 65 years. I have other friends that I've had for over 40 years, over 40 years in this church. They're family to me. They're dear to me. I gained those things, even though there were people who were, at one time, I would have done all I could to be of help to them who no longer wanted to be my friend. I lost, but I gained. Not only do you gain family, but he says, you need to understand that following me is going to be difficult because you receive all these blessings, but you also, verse 30, they come sometimes with persecution because there's going to be hurt, there's going to be pain, there's going to be loss. You may lose some that you at one time thought of as your friends, but you do gain. In Psalm 27, 10, it says, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Because of the love of Christ and the family, you're going to be blessed in many ways. But verse 31 will close. Many who are first will be last and the last first. You may appear now to be the last due to persecution and loss. You may lose all that you have. The day will come when you gain everything. While those who thought they had everything will find that in reality, they had nothing. In reality, it is they who will be the last. In Psalm 73, verses three through five, it says this, I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They're free from the burdens common to man. <laughs> They're not plagued by human ills. He goes on in verses 12 and 13 to say, this is what the wicked are like, always carefree. They increase in wealth. Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. In vain have I washed my hands in innocence. 
Then he finally says in verses 16 through 19, when I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on a slippery ground, on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. So you see, the rich who reject Christ will be spiritually poor forever. But the poor who receive Christ will receive spiritual riches that last forever. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. You have never given up anything. You have gained everything, is what Jesus is saying. And this rich young fool went away grieved because he had great possessions. He didn't use material wealth. Material wealth used him. The power, the prestige, the honor, all the privileges and pleasures that he had on the face of the earth were more important than eternal life. Jesus doesn't tell every person to do exactly that. You may not have great estates and all. What he's saying is you need to yield whatever is, is, is trapping you and you need to pursue the things that are eternal. And the things that are eternal, well, there's no way that you could ever do anything better than having what God has for you. So don't be a rich young fool. Be a follower of Jesus Christ. Father, we ask that you would work within us we ask, Lord, that we would learn. Because in our day, we, we think of riches in a different way. We don't realize that, that in the face of the planet, Americans are amongst the richest who've ever lived. We don't realize that. And we don't realize what can propel us in life. And what you're simply saying to this rich, young, prestigious man is you need to leave it all behind and follow me, which is what Christianity is, leaving everything behind and following you. Lord, I ask that you would do a work in all of our hearts that we might understand that the only thing that lasts into eternity is what we have yielded to you. And I ask, Father, that your Holy Spirit would work in us and as Christians, Lord, we sometimes get caught up with everything that's going around us and, and, and we take our eyes off of you. Like the Apostle Peter walking on water, we, we see the storm around us and we get distracted by it. It's very easy. I just ask that you help us to refocus our attention on you, to walk with you, Lord, and to trust you. And I, li I lift every one of us, Lord, those of us who are right now here in this live, Lord, and and, and for those who later on will, I just pray that you work in each one of our lives. That we would follow you and let go of anything that would keep us from doing so. And even as our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed, there may be some right now that the Lord is speaking to. You need to get right with him, and you know it. I want to pray for you right now. If you know you need to be right with the Lord and you need prayer, whether it means... To, God, I need to be born again, or whether it, it means that you've, you've been distracted, whatever the case may be, as our eyes remain closed for a moment, and you need prayer, and you want to be right with the Lord, would you raise your hand? Let me pray for you right where you're at. Just raise your hand. Just be honest before God. Father, you see these hands. These are honest people. These are people who know exactly where they're at right now, and they need your help, and Lord, I thank you for that. I ask that you would reach down and touch these whose hands are raised, and Lord, there are some who aren't raising the hand right now, but I know that it's in their heart they're saying, I, I need you too. I'm, I'm lifting them. And I pray that you would flood their, their, their soul with an awareness of who you are, that you would wash and cleanse them. And Lord, that they would be just being opened up to you right now. May you fill them with your presence. And Father, have your way in them. So we lift them to you. And we ask, Lord, as they say, God, be merciful to me. Help me. Lord, we know you will. And we ask this now, Lord, because it brings glory to you and it'll bless them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. You can put your hands down. And as our eyes remain closed for a moment, there may be some right now who are physically going through an illness that you, 
you're asking the Lord to touch you, you need a healing, I want to pray for you. I'm no healer, but God is. I just want to pray for you. And if you need to, your body touch, would you raise your hands? Let me pray for you right where you're at. Father, you see these whose hands are being raised. You know the condition that they're in right now. You know the physical condition of their body. Lord, you know everything about it. You know what the doctors have said. You know how they feel. I just ask that your hand would be merciful and touch them, Lord, as they raise their hands to you and say, God, please heal me. Please do a work in me. Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would. Because, Jesus, as we read your word, you healed all manner of disease. We're simply asking that you would do that. And there are friends of ours, Lord, that come to mind, even as I pray now. Could, we're asking for a miracle. We're asking for a touch in their lives, too, Lord. We ask that you would bring healing and be glorified. So in faith, we ask, Lord. And we pray that you would. And we receive, Lord, and say, thank you, Jesus. And we bless you. You can put your hands down. And Jesus, as we're about to leave here, we, we came to learn of you. May we put into practice what we've learned. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Let's all stand. Amen. Amen. There's a lot going on. I invite you to be part of it. If you're, able to, if you're in the Young Adults Catalyst Age Group, we invite you to be there tomorrow night at 7.30 in the banquet hall. We invite you men to be part of our breakfast that we have on Tuesday, breakfast and Bible study. Wednesday, we continue our series in the book of Ephesians. We're getting to the place that teaches us how to walk with the Lord. And pretty soon, we're going to be in chapter 5, which uh, gives to us insight into our marriage and family. And I'm going to take, a, take some time developing. Uh, I haven't taught on marriage and family for some time. We'll be doing that on Wednesday nights. You might want to start showing up and get prepared for that. We're going to get into that and do some details on that. So I'd love to have you with us. And again, if you're interested in Israel, we'll be taking a, uh, an interest sign-up. Father, we ask that you would work in us and through us and use us. We've come to church to know you. As we leave, we ask that we might take what we have learned and live it in the community that you have given to us. We bless you and we thank you. We lift up this nation to you. We lift up the president, vice president. We lift up the Congress. We lift up the judiciary. We ask that your hand would superintend. We ask that you would do a work, Father. We ask especially that Jesus Christ would, would be honored. And we lift these things to you now, Father, praying that you would have your way. And even as we gather this upcoming week for the National Day of Prayer, Lord, put it on our hearts to come and pray. And we ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Let's sing one more song of praise the Lord, church, before we go to you. We're going to sing, Here I Am Before You.
Church family, we love you guys. If you have need for prayer today, for any reason right now, come on up front. Men and women leaders are going to be right here right now to pray with you and pray over you. God bless you. Hope to see you Wednesday and Thursday for the National Day of Prayer, Church. See you soon.